What's up, YouTube? This is True Off the TV. So, as promised, today I will start my uh, top 10 all time backcourt duo or perimeter duo uh, list. This is a list of what I think are the greatest uh, backcourts the NBA has ever seen as far as sheer dominance. Um, now, I want to say this. This is subjective. You're not going to agree with where I have everybody listed. Um, there are going to be some backcourts that aren't listed here that you're going to say, why aren't they here? And, you know, you can give your case as to why they should be listed. I'm always a person willing to listen to other evidence, and that could perhaps change my mind. Uh, what I'm saying is just my opinion. It's not the rule of law. Uh, you can have your own individual top 10 back. But I really do wish for you guys to put your own list up uh, in the comment section. Um, I do want to say this. I've seen some backcourts listed, and... I wonder why they, look, I'm not going to say uh, positions because I don't want to give too much away. But I've seen some backcourts listed, right? But they had the small forward instead of a shooting guard. To me, the backcourt is the point guard and the shooting guard. I don't consider the small forward part of the backcourt. I just don't. I consider the backcourt the two guards. Um, I've seen some people list small forwards. Uh, now, I was willing to, to, to say to myself, well, sometimes small forwards can be playing a shooting guard position. But in the times that they were crediting this particular small forward or particular small forwards, they were playing small forward. They weren't playing a shooting guard. So I'm very strict about that. I only list point guards and, and shooting guards. Um, also, I do penalize a little bit if one of the players is substantially more talented and gifted than the other player. I tend to like to put a backcourt up there where both guys are all-star caliber players at the time, at least, that they they were a dominant backcourt. Um, you know, so I penalize a little bit because of that. But now that I've said all of that, it's my number 10, all right? Now, for younger people, this is going to be a backcourt that does not pop up. But if you were alive 40 years ago watching basketball in the pre-Magic Johnson, uh, Larry Bird era, if you're watching basketball 1979, 1980, this would be one of the first backcourts to pop in your mind. They weren't together very long, which is why I have them lower. Okay, uh, they weren't together very long. Uh, Dennis Johnson left and uh, went to play with the Phoenix Suns after the, I believe, it was the '79 '80 season. And Gus Williams uh, had a contract dispute. I think he missed the '81 '82 season. I believe it was. So they weren't together very long. But when they were together, NBA uh, historians. NBA players at the time ranked them as one of the greatest and most dominant backcourt duos the NBA had ever seen. Their games meshed very well with each other. Uh, now, Dennis Johnson, most of us remember him for his tenure with the Boston Celtics. By that time, Dennis Johnson was closing in on 30 years old, I believe, when he joined them. Or he was a 30. I think he closed in on 30. And... Um, he was a little bit heavier. And, you know, Dennis was not as preoccupied with scoring by then. He was more of just a defensive presence, you know, with the boss himself. But when he was playing with the Phoenix Suns, I think Phoenix is when he was at his prime. That's when he was scoring the most. But he was becoming, getting in his prime when he was with the Seattle Sonics, all right? Now, what made them mesh so well is that Dennis Johnson was a defensive monster, okay? 
Uh, Dennis Johnson is one of the great defensive players the league has ever seen. Um, he could score, but he was never a great shooter. He was more of a slasher type player. Um, he was bigger, 6'5", maybe about 195, maybe then, something like that. He was about 190, 195. He was bigger. Gus Williams was about 6'2", and maybe 175. I'm thinking off the top of my head. So he was smaller, but Gus Williams was the was the better natural scorer. He was the more explosive scorer. He was the better shooter. Gus Williams was not shabby on defense. He was more of a guy that got steals. But Dennis Johnson was the guy that would shut you down. But both of them could score the basketball. Okay? And um, they were also players that stepped up their overall games in the postseason. And when the stakes got higher, they rose their games. Now, together, as players, from 1978 to 1980, Dennis Johnson averaged 17.5 points, 4.9 rebounds, 3.8 assists, 1.5 steals, and 1.1 assists. Uh, Gus Williams averaged 20.7 points, 3.3 rebounds, 4.5 assists, 2.3 steals per game. So they were both terrors on both sides of the court. With Dennis Johnson uh, getting steals with his quickness, uh, you know, so he was a terror in the passing lanes, and, and Dennis Johnson was just a beast defensively, chased down blocks, uh, just, you know, he was able, I mean, he was one of those guys that was a pest, and he was strong, and he, uh, could bully, uh, as, as much as the rules allow, uh, scores. What I mean by bully is, he would make their lives miserable. When you, the game was more physical back then, it was very difficult to have a great game against Dennis Johnson. And then on the offensive end, they both could score at a really good clip. And they were seen as probably the most dominant, uh, or at least one of the, at the time, the two most dominant backcourts in the history of the game. Now in the postseason, they rose their game, their games collectively. In the postseason from 1977, the 1980, Dennis Johnson averaged 18 points, five rebounds, which was very strong for a uh, guard at that time. Uh, Dennis Johnson averaged five rebounds, 3.7 assists, 1.4 steals, 1.1 blocks. And Gus Johnson, Gus Williams, excuse me, uh, averaged 22.4 points in the postseason, four rebounds, 4.4 4 assists, and 2.1 steals. They both... Uh, appeared, I believe, in, I believe it was three consecutive uh, Western Conference Finals. I believe it was three consecutive Western Conference Finals. And they, and they went to back-to-back, back-to-back uh, -back, uh, NBA Finals in 1978 and 1979. After dropping the first game of the Finals to the then reigning champion, Washington Bullets, they won four games in a row. And Gus Williams and Dennis Johnson just dominated the NBA Finals. Uh, Gus averaged almost 29 points per game. Uh, Dennis Johnson averaged more than 22 points. Uh, together, they averaged 51 points a game. They both accounted for more. I think they both accounted for something like almost half of the Phoenix, uh, excuse me, of the Seattle Supersonics scoring in that series. I mean, they were a more dominant duo than Elvin Hayes and Wes Unseld had, was at the time for the Washington uh, Bullets. I mean, they really dominated that series. And they were single-handedly the reason why they were able to pull away and beat the Washington Bullets. The reason why they don't rank higher is because they weren't together as long. But had they played longer, they would be a much higher. They would have been much higher on this list. Um, I also wonder if that Sonics team had stayed together and maybe shore up, showing up their roster 
if Dennis Johnson ever left, I wonder if they could have at least competed with the Lakers. Now, that would have been a formidable task, but I wonder if they would have been able to compete with the Lakers. Remember, this was the Seattle Sonics, uh, you know, a relatively smaller franchise, uh, you know, but I think Gus, people know about Dennis Johnson, but Gus Williams is one of those guys that I think has fallen off the radar when it comes to NBA fans. Like, he is the second best point guard to ever play for the Seattle franchise. That includes the Oklahoma uh, Thunder. Um, yes, and I am saying I think he was better than Russell Rushbrook. Far better as a player than Russell Rushbrook. He didn't, he didn't play as long as Russell Westbrook, but he was a much better player, uh, much better defender, much higher basketball IQ. Uh, he wasn't as athletic or quite as explosive, but he was explosive, had a great first step, a uh, greater shooter, a better, much better clutch player, much better decision maker. Uh, he wasn't a traditional point guard per se, uh, but he could, he was a good passer, but he was one of those, he was one of those first point guards that had the scorer mentality. Uh, you saw that with Nate Archibald, of course, Oscar Robinson was just a whole different beast, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, I think that this is one of those underrated backcourts that was, that has forgotten, been, been forgotten in history because most people just think of the Lakers, you know what I'm saying? The Lakers and how dominant they were in the 80s. But before the Lakers, before Magic Johnson and the Lakers took over the 80s, it looked like the Sonics were going to be that dynasty team that unfortunately Portland couldn't be because of the injury to Bill Walton. Uh, the 70s was known for parity in the NBA. What people forget is that Portland in the 77-78 season Started off 50 and 10. All right. They were on pace to win something like 67, 68 games. And they almost would have surely won the championship. But Bill Walton got hurt in the 60th game of the season. And the rest of the way, Portland went 8 and 14. They were completely discombobulated after the injury. They finished 58 and 24, but they weren't the same team. And Bill Walton never played another game for the Portland Trailblazers. Fate also got in the way of the Sonics, free agents, free agent, uh, uh, you know, free agent uh, departures, contract issues, which sort of put a stain on the Sonics and kept other free agents from joining, uh, injuries, uh, you know, acquisitions like Dennis, uh, David Thompson, excuse me, being saddled with drug issues. So the Sonics were, after their heyday became a pretty poor franchise until, uh, or gradually became a poor franchise until the mid to late 80s when they got acquisitions like Tom Chambers and uh, Xavier McDaniel and Dale Ellis and such and such. And then later on, of course, the great days with Gary Payton and Sean Kemp and those guys. But yeah, this is my number 10, all right? Now, this might not be on a lot of people's list as far as top 10, but I have a special affinity with defense. I think you'll notice that uh, on these lists. So I'm a little bit biased. I'm not going to lie. But uh, my number 10, as far as backcourt duos, Gus Williams and Dennis Johnson. Tell me what you guys think.